In this video, we're going to be showing you exactly how to use the ScanNet model to predict protein-protein interaction sites on a given input protein structure. If you aren't familiar with Neurosnap, it's essentially a website where you can access a bunch of different machine learning tools and models like DiffDoc, AlphaFold, and whatnot without actually having to deal with the uh, normal hassles that you would for bioinformatics, such as downloading models, setting things up, and acquiring expensive GPUs. Uh, additionally, we have a really fantastic free tier that you can uh, check out and see if it works for you. Now for ScanNet, what you want to do is you want to essentially just access uh, the tool by searching it over here in the search bar, scrolling through. And now that we've selected the tool, what we'll do is we'll have to configure things to uh, you know, meet the requirements of our experiment. So one thing to keep in mind for ScanNet is that it is somewhat of an interesting model, especially when compared to uh, a typical approach, which would be to use something like molecular docking. So for molecular docking, what you're effectively doing is you're trying to predict an interaction between uh, an input receptor and an input ligand. So the receptor could be something like, uh, you know, a protein or maybe even a nucleotide. And the ligand, it could be another protein or a small molecule like a drug or a cofactor. Or it could even be something like a nucleotide, like a piece of DNA or RNA. Now, scan that is interesting in the sense that instead of predicting a three-dimensional structure of the receptor uh, bound to the ligand, instead of what we're going to be doing is we're just going to be predicting which residues actually play a role in these protein-protein interactions. So this is cool as it gives us a, a, a somewhat ligand ambiguous way to assess uh, which residues are the most important and play like the most pivotal roles in like the formation of certain protein-protein interactions. Now for our input structure that we're going to be using in this demonstration, we're going to be using the 8QH0 structure from the PDB, which is essentially the SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain bound to an antibody. So this over here, these two chains colored in uh, orange and um, purple, these are going to be the two chains for the antibody. And this green one over here is going to be the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. Now what we're going to do is we're just going to select it as the input structure and upload it here. The next step is to specify the binding type. So the binding type is essentially, there's three different modes. There's protein-protein binding sites. We have B-cell epitope binding sites, as well as the sorted protein binding sites. For this demonstration, we're just going to be using the protein-protein binding site mode. Chain ID essentially allows you to specify which chains you want to pass into the model. If you leave this empty, then all chains will be passed into the model, and the model will predict the interaction uh, site probabilities for every single chain. This is what we want to do for our demonstration, so we'll, we're just going to leave this empty. Now for assembly, this one is a little bit more complicated. If we go back to this structure, as we can see, there's multiple chains. And uh, essentially, ScanNet has two options. Either it can consider the interchain interactions, or it can completely ignore them and pretend that every single one of these proteins are in a monomeric state, and there's no binding domain or anything like that. So to be a little bit more specific, let's say hypothetically, uh, hypothetically we were to uncheck this option and we were to submit the structure. That would effectively mean that all interchain interactions would be completely ignored and every single one of these chains would be passed into the model individually, which would mean that like the orange chain over here would not be bound to uh, this purple chain or this green chain. So that would free up the residues that would normally be uh, playing a role like uh, being bound to like, um, you know, this protein or this protein. And it would essentially uh, free them up for the model and allow the model to then predict, uh, you know, where, where would this uh, chain interact with like other structures. However, if we were to keep this option checked, then the model would consider all the interchain interactions and it would see the entire structure all at once instead of each chain individually. So this would mean that, you know, uh, obviously these chains are already bound, uh, sorry, these residues are already bound to like this chain over here, which would mean that the model would not consider them as something that would be interacting with something else. Instead, it might consider something around here. You know, this is a, this is a purely hypothetical example or something maybe around over here that is a little bit more free to, you know, move around and interact with uh, another protein. So this is easier to see with an example. And what we're going to do is we're just going to go over here and we're going to hit run and we're going to come back once we get the actual results. All right, so we're now back with the results. And as we can see, this job took hardly any time to complete at all with only 26 seconds of runtime, which is fantastic. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go to the most interesting part of this analysis, which is, in my opinion, looking at the structure. 
as we can see, the structure is mostly gray, but there are a couple, uh, a couple orange residues. Now, what these orange residues mean is the more orange a residue is, the more, uh, the greater the binding site probability for those specific residues. As we can see for this structure, the binding site probabilities overall is very low, and the entire structure is mostly gray. And this makes a lot of sense, as we already have an entire antibody that's bound to the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. So there isn't a whole lot of real estate for more proteins, uh, for more protein interactions to actually, uh, you know, come about. Now, the next table that we want to look at is right over here, and essentially you can use this to uh, find out which residues. Uh, have the greatest binding site probabilities. As we can see, residue uh, position 466, which is an arginine, has a really, a, you know, a relatively high binding site probability of 68%. Now, this is pretty high, all things considered, but it could also be a false positive. So to actually determine whether or not something is a false positive, a couple of things that I personally look for is the proximity of other uh, residues that also have very high binding site probabilities. So this could come in a couple different ways. So for example, there might be residues that are immediately adjacent to one another. So for example, you could have residues, let's say hypothetically, um, or actually over here, you know, if we look, we have 355 and 354 and, um, and whatnot, and also 353 and 351. These residues are in very close proximity and they all have relatively high binding sites. So it's more likely for a binding site to kind of be formed around there, uh, if anywhere at all. Additionally, there is also spatial proximity. So you might have residues that are very close to one another um, that might form like an epitope or something. But these, um, but these uh, residues might not be very close to each other on the actual, like in terms of residue position, but they might be spatially oriented in a way where they're very close to each other uh, geometrically. So in this case, uh, you'd have to manually look for for those types of sites as well, and that's where the that's why I also like the structure. Um, the structural view a lot more instead of like the table view, but you have both. And naturally, we also have a summary of the table over here that essentially tells us the exact same information, but it also give us, gives us a little bit more of an intuitive visualization. Now, the next thing I want to do is I also want to show you this uh, in the other mode. So if you remember, we had the assembly mode previously, but there's also the option to uncheck it. So what I did was I actually unchecked it and did a separate run over here. And as we can see, it's a it's a very different story. So once it, when assembly mode is not checked, every single chain is ran independently. And this is why we see a lot more orange because now you know individually these chains do form a protein protein interactions as we as you can very easily tell in this uh, demonstration. However, when you put them together, you know they might not be interacting with like a fourth protein. So what's even more useful in my opinion is if you head over to the actual surface view, what we can do is we can still color by the actual um, protein, um, sorry, the binding probabilities. And we can see that the, the residues that are bound to the, to the other chains, or at least in close proximity to the other chains, they seem to be correctly uh, labeled as having like a very high binding probability. So this is a fantastic thing to see, especially within um, you know the context of our little demonstration. Now we have the exact same values over here. This is just, uh, I want to show you what the table looks like, um, you know, in the different mode for this version of it as well. And additionally, I also have like a little bonus example that I would like to share with everybody. So this protein over here is actually an enzyme. It's beta lactamase. And funny enough, we see that the residues with relatively high binding site probabilities are also in very close proximity to the catalytic residues and in the active site of the enzyme. Now this is quite interesting, a scanet was designed for predicting protein binding sites, but it seems that it might also offer some utility for predicting enzyme active sites as well. Now please take this with a grain of salt as we haven't empirically evaluated or assessed this model on this task yet, however it's something certainly worth uh, keeping in mind as it might, be, it might be pretty useful down the line. Now I really hope you all enjoyed this video, and as always please give us a like or subscribe if you want to see more tutorials like this. Additionally if you have any questions or suggestions, uh, by all means leave a, leave a comment below and we'll try our best to get back to you.